Uh, I'll be talking on how to fund a company. And I'm just curious, how many of you are involved in startups that are purely virtual? So software, no physical thing. How many? How many are involved in something that has a physical element, like this one? Yeah. And I'll try to take the perspective of actually those who have that, because from an investor perspective, it's very, very different. And I know it's also something that Dan will elaborate on when, when he gives his, his presentation. So how to get funding for a hardware-based startup? Um, I'm uh, I invest in these companies, and that's really a mix of software, hardware, game, whatever. Um, and the perspective I'm taking will be the perspective of early stage. Because it's very, very different getting a startup or company funded that has 200 employees, cash flow positive, or whatever. I guess most of you are in the same stage as we normally are in, sort of here. We have maybe a cool team or prototype, maybe even we have a few users, but most of you will not be profitable. That's my guess, at least that's my perspective for the next half hour. That is basically how to get funding in these early days and not here. Because when you are these 200 people, multi-billion or million dollar company and profitable, it's a very, very different sources of capital. So what, what happened if you take the early stage perspective? How are we thinking about that? You know, I'm actually involved or have been involved in three, you can say, hardware-based companies. One is Recon Instruments, which uh, this is Dan's co-founder, Hamid, with, I guess, an early prototype or something like that. Uh, so that is basically electronics for ski goggles. Then I'm involved as co-founder of Multility Count, which is a sperm quality test kit. This is a picture of one of their um, prototypes. And I'm an investor in Plato Science, which is a neurostimulation device. I call it the thinking hat, right? All hardware-based, of course, different. But if you take the positive glasses on, then one of the cool things you can do is that you have something to show. So imagine that you're clued in in the first days. You have this amazing software, but it's something that is running on your computer, right? It's really, really hard to show an investor and impress an investor. One of the good things about having something physical is actually you can say, look here, I have something. Because that has a value both for me, the early stage investor, but also I know in the later stages, which I'll come back to. So that's for, clear, for, um, for sure a very positive thing. And that's why I'm really struggling when I'm involved in these super, super cool software startups. And people ask me, what are you doing? Yeah, we have this graph working in the background, but most of your investors will be laymen, right? So most of the investors in a software company will not understand the coding. So what can you show? Most of our investors in these companies are not experts in electronics or sperm quality or neurostimulation. But by having something to show you, that's really, really um, powerful. And one of the reasons why it's powerful is actually because there are some other funding opportunities available when you have something fiscal. Especially if you have a, you can say a gimmick or a gadget that is for the B2C market. So if you take Plato Science, which is this neurostimulation device, they've been running their own uh, crowdfunding campaign for pre-orders on the website. They started this in May and basically said to people, buy now, uh, we'll ship before end of year. Many consumers are willing to do that for a physical product. Imagine that if I came to you and said, I've developed this uh, CM system or whatever, or an app or whatever, uh, please give me $200 now and then I'll deliver in six months. You will not buy. But you can actually do that either on your own website or on sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Yeah, I know, Dan, you also did it on your own site when you had to de uh, develop Recon yet. Exact same thing on your own website, pre-orders, right? And that's extremely strong because when you have these pre-orders, then you can go to the second round of investors and saying, hey, Look here, I already proved there is a market because I have X hundred people that have, that have pre-ordered. But I'll also be very honest and say it's not all products you can do that for. Something as we can get perfect is something you can brag about, right? Oh my God, I have the latest gadget. Something as nerdy as Plato Science, yeah, also. It's something people are really, there's a whole uh, Reddit community around neurostimulation. But imagine that I said to you, please order my sperm quality test online. We have a lot of men here. 
How many of you have poor sperm quality? It's, it's not like exactly like you're raising your hands, right? So it's non-viral. So these are the total two opposite, right? This is what you like to brag about. This, you not even dare to buy it there because could people see that I bought this product? Even my friends would be scared to like the Facebook page, right? Oh, do my friends then think I have poor sperm quality? So at least for some products, it can be positive. That's a good part about hardware startups. And now we come to all the ugly one. Um, production. Getting production of consumer products is just a pain in the butt. And it's very, very expensive. Initially, when you have an idea for a product, let's say this one, it's very cheap, right? Because you do 3D printing out there and you do it. At some point in time, you have to deliver 10,000 of those. And most likely, it's not real viable for you to do it in 3D printing. It's too costly, whatever. And most likely, you will have to do it then in plastic molding and also electronics. And you might even be using uh, subcontractors for that. And basically, they will ask and say, well, yeah, the setup price for that is X hundred thousand. Just plastic molding. I know way too much about plastic molding now. When you have one of those, you need a tool for that. The tool itself, before you can start production, costs maybe $30,000. Guess what? You need a lot of tools for this. So when you're a startup and you have to produce something very, very simple, you, you quickly end up in half a million euro or something like that just in startup cost. And if you compare that to those of us who are involved in software, we're basically just shipping something and just like, yeah, it's shit, but let's ship it and see what works, right? When you have hardware, you have to take all these costs. And it's really, really hard. So as an early stage investor, I meet these people who have this hardware idea. And I say, yeah, you can get it to work. But what will it cost to get into production? And that is so expensive and so annoying. And that will really be a red flag for, for many investors. Because those of us who have been involved in that, we are very, very skeptical. And that goes for both. A simple product like that. There's no electronics in this, by the way. And I'll guess that all startup costs for tools or whatever was maybe half a million uh, euro. Plato haven't started yet. It's still 3D printed. My guess it will be the same. You also have a lot of costs for yours, right? It's really, there's no way around it. Um, and that also leads to another problem with hardware based startup from an investor perspective. That is, we all try to, oh, lean startup, build, measure, learn. We all do that in software. But when you're going to ship something, these are product pictures from utility count, right? So imagine you find out that this inside of this device, that has a problem. In software, you sit over the weekend, you go all in, you fix it, ship a new version. In hardware, you have these boxes, oh my God, how are I going to do that? And if there's a mistake on the carton or whatever, it's just very, very hard. Um, and again, this often takes place with some contractors. Motility Count don't have its own production facility for many good reasons, meaning that we have a subcontractor who's doing that for us. So if we have to iterate of physical product, it'll be damn expensive to have people who are paid 200 kronos an hour sitting and replacing stuff. Um, so again, I'm not saying that you can't do it with a hardware and can't make a hardware startup work, but this is very different, difficult uh, compare that to the virtual world. And then every time I meet a startup, we always dream about let's sell, sell directly to consumers. We will sell to consumers globally, directly. We have this web page and we'll sell. And of course, you can get some consumers to buy online. But guess what? Most of our stuff is still bought either by a retailer because, well, guess what? Japanese consumers most likely they don't know about swim count. So if I want to go to Japan and sell my device, well, maybe I need a web shop or physical shop. Guess what? I most likely also need a wholesaler to get all the logistics there. And I most likely also need some kind of brand because, well, these people here, this is just for, for dance industry, right? You know, ski, ski, uh, ski equipment that's poured so billions of dollars in advertising in there. 
So if they should choose between my product and this branded product, guess what? Con consumers uh, like that. So most of us dream about this, and we can do that in small scale, but in large scale, you see this channel there. At such that is not a problem, except that this guy here expects to earn 50% margin. This wholesaler expects to have 20-30% 30, 30% margin. And then maybe you have a brand in here that expects also a 50-60-70% margin. So yes, you might sell a product out here for thousands of euro or krona or whatever, but the percentage you get is very low. And it's really not that many startups that have managed to do this in a global scale directly. It's just, yeah, I don't know. GoPro did a little bit, right? And then they also sort of failed a bit and went into physical distribution channels, but they're not that many. Do you know anyone who succeeded then? No, it's, it's really hard at a high price point. I think if you're below 100 bucks, then it's not feasible yeah. that yeah. you can do it. But above that, the customer acquisition costs end up being almost as high as if you go through the distribution channel. Yeah. And then yeah. you're fighting for keywords and all that stuff. And then you have huge economics of scale, right? So this is, um, this is an area I know about it. Ovulation test, right? This is sold for 20 bucks, 15 bucks, 15 euro in the shop. What do you think the manufacturing cost for one of those is? What? One, two? Because you produce in hundreds of thousands of units. But when you're a startup, you can't order 100,000 units. You order 1,000. Meaning that there's so huge economics of scale here. And when you want to go into the retailers, you know, it's really, really hard for you as a startup to be on the right pl places here. And again, the consumers don't know you because you don't have a brand. I guess there's a reason why many of the products we buy from consumer electronics to whatever is con uh, consolidated on a few players. So now we're really depressed, huh? But I guess Dan is an, is an example that it can be done. But I'm just saying this is what you'll meet when you go out to early stage investors. That is, oh my God, this is going to be expensive and hard. Um, so, so how do we get the funding for that? I'll say this is extremely basic, but don't go to investors before you have a team. And a team in my uh, world or for early stage startup only consists of two different roles. Someone who can produce a product or develop and someone who can sell. And that's really basic. It's actually one of the problems I teach at CBS, and I have all these who have a degree in strategic brand, whatever, and I ask them, so what can you do? Can you sell or can you produce or manufacture? You know, it's the, you know. And later on, when you're 20 or 30 people, there's, there's a, a space for a finance person or a marketing manager, whatever. But when you are in the early days, it's basically these two roles. Then you'll have to understand that the first investors are most likely someone that know you. These are stats from US. My guess will be the distribution is the same in, in Europe. When you take uh, the funding so, uh, sources for small companies, it's primarily yourself. And the next one is friends and family, which is the same size as all the other capital sources. And that is, of course, because in the early days, the only thing you have is trust in you, meaning personal trust. You don't really have any data, right? You sit there and said, oh my God, I want to make consumer electronics built into ski goggles. And this would be great. Maybe. But you don't have any sales. You don't have any agreements. You don't have anything. The only thing you have is trust in you. And that normally means it's people that know you already. Because if I met one of you the first time now, the chance that I really trust you is close to zero, right? Because I don't know what you've done in the past or how you behaved. If I was to take a Danish example, uh, Trustpilot, I guess the most funded Danish startup, we all hear about the big funding rounds and the VCs. Guess what? The first investor, his uncle, who invested 13,000 euro. And that is, that is typical. So you typically go through these people who know you very well, 
like an uncle, people you know sort of, local business angels, local VCs, international VCs. Um, so, so, and I think it's, it can be very tempting to, to, sorry this is in Danish, but I just have to find it, I found this today Dan. And it's still, so in 2009 I was an investor in Recon and I discussed it with Dan to buy more shares. And I just, this shows really good ethics, sorry this is in Danish, but basically here Dan says, I really, really sure you want to invest in my startup. There's so many things that go, go wrong, please re reconsider. And I think honestly that's what you have to do because you only have to take money from people that can afford losing them and understand the risk. So if your uncle is a multi-billionaire, take the money and run. But if your, mo if your uncle is sort of only have a little bit of money from his house and don't understand this risk, you shouldn't take the money. I've seen so many friendships break up due to startups that fail. And then three years later, two years later, you have to go to your uncle or friend and say, I lost the money. And if that person really didn't understand risk. Uh, but again, most of these startups, you know, I was one of the first investors. Why? Because I trusted Dan. If I just met Dan uh, randomly if, one week before, I would never have invested. Uh, and then the next step are typically business angels, right? Business angels here defined as people who invest their own money uh, and they don't really know you. And that's a gray area because most of them are local and sort of know who you are. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you take Balder here with, uh, with his thinking hat, it's a, it's a, it's a um, prototype of the neurostimulation device. So classic example, he's a local entrepreneur. I heard about him from Sean, who basically says, Nikolai, this is so crazy, you might be interested, right? So already there, I had a guy I trust who told me this is interesting. Okay, so I invested. And, uh, and then after me, one of my acquaintances, Dietleo, he actually on Facebook update, he was looking for technology like that. And then he said, Nikolai, do you know? Yeah, I just invest in this company. And this is for one of our, we go to these trips where we, I, try, I think we tried to make a fire there. Didn't really work, but we at least tried two hours. But it just, you know, Business angel investing is also about trust and building that trust. And that's why you have to also understand that many business angels don't really invest only due to money. Because, for instance, in, 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 one, of, in one of the investors in Dan's company is worth a few hundred million euro. So imagine that Dan and I come to him and said, Dear Peter, you can make 10 million kron on this investment. Will it matter for him? No. He should just put the money in the bank uh, or the professional money manager and don't care. So why is a person like him investing? Most likely for other reasons. Because he thinks it's fun, because he wants to make a difference, because he wants to help people like that. And one of the big mistakes I see in early stage investing is that you reach out to business agents and only ask for money. Because that's not the primary reason because most of us are cynical about investing in, in early stage startups and know that the risk is so high, so most likely we shouldn't do it. But we do it anyways, for all kinds of reasons. But come back to the trust part. Um, you all know this dragon then, Leon Tule, right? And they are first time entrepreneurs get this impression that you go on stage and pitch and then I get 200,000 kroner, right? You know, it's fake. It, it it's only works like that because it's on TV. And actually, these angels who are sitting out here actually know about the deal beforehand. They had checked the deal before. And we in Denmark, we've all heard about these, these companies before. No one invests based upon a 15-minute pitch. No one. And actually, Mark Suster and an American VC actually had this quote, uh, great quote saying, I don't invest in dot, I invest in a line. Because you meet people over time. And... You meet them there, and then you get drunk with them and see how they prototype the wall or whatever. At some point in time, you invest. You're not investing because you just met them. I didn't invest after the first meeting where CERN introduced me to Balder. We basically said, hey, I'm interested. Let's keep in touch. I met some crazy guys yesterday. 
who are building some really, really interesting software. And basically what I'm saying, let's talk after Christmas. I might uh, be able to help you with some leads. And then we see and meet. We're building trust. Um, and then when you reach out to people like, it could be me or business angels, try to be introduced. This is actually also a mail from CERN, I got permission, where CERN introduced me to some, some uh, geeks here in, in Denmark. And if you are introduced to these uh, persons by a mutual contact, the chance of a positive reply is just so much bigger. I remember I used it the same. I was reaching out to some VCs in the US. Uh, I think I had a really, really cool case, and I couldn't get through. They didn't answer my email. I then asked Dan, for, because I know he knew the VC, he made an introduction and the guy responded half, half an hour later, right? Because the deal flow in a VC or among famous business analysts is so big, they get thousands of requests um, a year, especially if you're reaching out to the US VCs, they basically say, well, unless we have someone in common, I heard about you before, I just press delete. They do not say that in public, but that's how it works. So try to get introduced. And then where to find them? Uh, in my single ways, there are three uh, major sources of business aid funding. They are all the ones you know from TV. Uh, and I think the problem is that, that they get too many requests and many of them are actually not that um, willing to take high risk anymore because now they have a brand to protect. So imagine if I'm, I'm, I'm famous from TV for being this really, really smart entrepreneur and you come with something really, really risky, I'm more afraid of losing my brand than losing my money. So I normally don't see these take the really, really early stage deals. They are, they're actually willing to pay a higher price to get, get in later. So I would say the majority is down here. Of course, you have business angel networks, which basically groups of angels uh, investing together. You, here in Copenhagen, you have uh, Danban. You can apply to get in front. You get your 10 minutes of fame, and then you, if there's an interest in angel, you start the dialogue there. Or alternatively, reach out to all those angels who are not member of a business angel network. I know, Ben, most of my uh, angel friends are not member of business angel networks because we source the deals directly. Those you can find by LinkedIn, company registers, etc. So I actually helped Dan and Recon in 2009 uh, get some further financing. Uh, and my approach were actually using my alumni network. And then I said, who could be interested in such uh, ski goggle with electronics? Guess what? It's most likely pe people who do skiing. So I just searched in our, in our database for, for um, persons who had done business angel investments and who skied. So that's 200 person. And I sent them, of course, individual emails, not spam, individual emails, right? And out of these 200, 100 sort of replied and said, we want to have more data. Dan had made a fantastic executive summary about how great they were. And we actually had 30 who were really interested. So 30 who were in real discussions where we set up conference call with Dan, et cetera, et cetera. And nine ended up being investing. Um, my point here is that getting angel investments normally is also a numbers game. You have to have enough leads in there. It's not about you contacting five angels. Most likely you're contacting 100. Um, and it's hard work. Getting funding for start startups is normally takes time. And what you also notice is that if you want to raise a significant round, there are not that many angels who are, who are capable or interested in investing, let's say, $1 million. The normal angel maybe invests 100,000 euro, something like that. Meaning that if you want to have this, was it $800,000? Something like almost 1 million Canadian, right? So that would be 5 million Danish krona. Way too much for an angel. But then you have to basically do the consortium and, and find these, in this case, 9 angels. 
The typical step after um, business angels is, is, is venture capital. And I actually spend not that time, much time on that because most of us think that we're ready for venture capital when we're not. Because we think that, oh my God, I heard about these big funds and they should invest in my app, right? Because now I've developed my app and it's almost done and they should invest 3 million euro. But, but VCs are actually looking for something really, really specific. Huge markets that can scale and you have something really unique. Um, and they like to see data, not dreams. And, and basically all over the world, I saw the statistics, if you take the entire world, there are 8,000 startups in the world getting VC funding, 8,000. So in Denmark, that's around 20, right? And what they do is they invest much later than you think because a VC would rather invest 2 million euro than 200,000 euro because a VC is structured in a way where they do on a fund maybe 20 investments and that fund is 100 million euro. And even though they allocate or reserve some of the funding for later, you know, they're not doing 200,000 euro. So I see way too many startups, including myself, have been spending time on chasing VCs way, way too early. So way too early would be an app with 200 users or a prototype for a, a goggle or whatever. The average startup who gets VC funding, that's only these 8,000, 8, my guess is they're three or four years old. Um, So that means that venture capital actually invests re relatively late. And you have this called value of death for startups is because initially it doesn't cost that much. But when you do something physical, it becomes, as I said earlier, so expensive that you have this value of death where a lot of startups fail. And I guess Dan can entertain with 10 near-death experiences of that being very expensive because suddenly you have to actually pay your supplier in Korea X million kroner, right? Um, so what you should do here is remember that actually there are a number of public support programs available. These are mostly local. There's also some international, but most of them are local. And it's a great source of, of capital uh, because it's non-dilutive, most of it, right? So why do they give money to startups like us? because they believe there are some externalities, right? So they actually believe that even a failed startup or high-risk startup is actually worth something for society. I think the best example could be, anyone you involved in biotech? Pharmaceutical? Yeah. You know, let's assume I met a researcher who had some interesting data from a petri dish. I can cure malaria. What is the chance that this would become a registered drug? We start with 0.001%, something like that, right? We have millions of researchers and there's maybe 30 drugs approved a year, something like that, right? And it'll take 15 years and it costs $1 billion. So for me as an investor, it doesn't make sense. But a society would say, hey, we can actually create some high tech job. We can create innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So they're actually willing to pay people like me. I think my, my, my summary here will be that you really have to dig into it because the, the grants that are relevant for you are not the same for you. It's really, are you into B2B, B2C? Are you some really, really nerdy things? Or are you an app? Are you hardware, software? Do you have something that is good for the environment? But, but in general, they are these types. Either you get a loan secured because uh, banks should not lend you money because it's high risk. But in many countries, including Denmark, you had uh, organizations that are actually securing the loans. So you actually can get a bank loan, either directly from Vexfonden or indirectly where the, you go to the bank and then Vexfonden guarantees. You can also get a lot of grants. Um, EU-based like SMS, SME instruments, one of my companies got 2 million euro for this. 2 million euro, non-diluted. Or uh, Danish ones like Innobooster or Marcus Mundingsfonden. Or of course also equity like the innovation centers like Pre-Seed, Carnoa and the others. 
you could always discuss you know the pros and cons of that is it better to have a business angel than a, a public body providing equity maybe but these i actually go in very very early and for instance most of my startups have received grants either from eu or um, or, or local danish ones uh, i know you also did a lot of recon you got a lot of you know phd scholarships and all that and it's amazing because with that kind of money which is normally not all you need but that you can then go to real investors and said hey i already got 200,000 from public fund x it's much easier for you and finally remember to secure the domain name so it's quite fun it's it's really war story but when we had this uh, dialogue with a very very wealthy investor very wealthy uh, he called me and said nikolai um my chairman um, just called me. What's going on on Recon.com? The problem was that Dan had called his company Recall Instruments. And you hadn't secured Recon.com because it was already taken by no one. But that became then a gay fetish site. So I just think learning here is remember to buy a .com domain. It was actually already taken. It was already taken. Yeah, and we just had to go ahead and use So that's why you get inspiration. You're already a user of the site and, and already like that. Yeah. <coughs> my final comment before we stop is actually that do you need the money now because most of our startups need some kind of funding it would be ideally if all our customers paid up front but realistically when we're doing high tech we often need money from our production marketing and but the problem is if you take a lot of money too early you get really really diluted and i, I never met a founder who says in hindsight hey gosh i should have taken money in earlier but I meet a lot of founders who said, well, we should have waited four or five months. So our valuation picked up. This is actually a permission I got from Dan to get the real valuation of Recon during the different funding rounds, right? So when you take money here, you don't get that much for 10%. Meaning that you do four or five or six of these rounds and you are maybe three or four founders, you end up diluted a lot. So I would, I think in the beginning, I was so afraid of, of being too slow. I'd personally be much more afraid of getting diluted too, too much now. Uh, that would be my, because this is a long journey. The, the journey from Recon was, what, seven years, eight years, something like that. And that's average, right? It's really, really hard uh, or rare that you meet someone who has done, especially hardware in two or three years. It always takes a lot of time. Uh, that, that's basically my part of the story, which is hopefully I didn't scare too much, but hardware is really, really hard. Um, there are, of course, some great opportunities, but, but please be aware that many early stage investors will be scared. So you have to find a way where you can provide credible answers to how expensive will it actually be to manufacture and how can you really sell it in a distribution chain that makes... Um, uh, sense for you. If someone wants to, I have a book for sale, very, very cheap. I also accept Nielsen coins, but mostly it's mobile pay. <laughs> so uh, what, I, what I suggest we do now is just a five, seven minute break uh, while we set up dance and you can take a bio break. There is um, a toilet here. Before we, any questions? Yeah. Uh, you have to make a due diligence of those. Uh, the, 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 the problem is that there's a big difference between mon money from a government fund and money from me. For me, it's about do I trust you, do I like you, let's drink a beer together. A government fund has to be very objective, meaning that you have to send in an application, right? You have to file an application and that has to be written and if you're not good at that, or not experienced at that, or don't have time for that, uh, I just, even though I could send uh, these applications myself actually in one of my startups we just used one of these consultants so i would say yes it can make sense but you should ask the consultant for references and call those because anyone here could say i'm a public grant consultant right uh, give me twenty thousand, and i'll write your application 
Uh, but I just know that the good one of these consultancies, they have much higher win wage than, uh, than you would have. And if you're going to re re something like this, we actually did it ourselves. I think we spent, I don't know, 300, hour 300 hours on that. It's my guess. Uh, I don't know. There's so many. These covers the 90%. Yes. So SME instruments is for sure the most relevant for any early stage startup. There's a big number, but they are relevant for when you have 100 employees. When you are five, ma five persons in a basement, it's these two. And in Denmark, it's Inno Booster. Yeah, I guess Inno Booster, uh, Market Monings Fund, if you're just a recent graduate, also Inno Founder are really, really good on the grants. Um, they also have the big innovation fund, also have the big one, Grant Solutions, but that has to be really, really nerdy. Uh, one of my startups just got one of those, by the way, but that's also really, you know, nerdy. This car was, yeah. Cool. Other questions? Let's take a break then, and then uh, Dan will go uh, on stage afterwards.